All right. You guys feeling okay this morning? Man, you guys seem all down and depressed. Does the cold weather do this to you? Cold weather is awesome, isn't it? Yeah. I think there's a couple people just saying, eh, let him talk. I don't believe this. This feels great. Well, let's get all on the same page because I feel like we might be a little bit disjointed this morning. We might be a little distracted. So let's, let's get on the same page. Bow your heads with me and say this prayer with me. Say, God, help me get everything I need to get because sometimes I don't get it. So help me to get it and not forget it. In Jesus' name, <laughs> I don't be a see. You guys are not on your game, man. You got to be on your game with me today. Okay? I'm for real. We've been going through a series called What If. Say what if. What if. And we started on what we're doing, for those who don't know, we're going through the foundations, the pillars of what Cornerstone is going to be built upon. And so the very first week, we started right out of the gate with what if we loved, right? What if we loved? Because if we start this whole process of building a church and the foundation is not love, then it is useless. Amen? So we went on from what if we loved and what if we lived by faith and we moved on to faith because faith is going to be a huge component of what we do. We have faith that God can heal. We have faith that God can restore. We have faith that God can deliver. Amen? We moved on to grace because you know what? What if we actually gave grace? It's not something that a lot of people think of, oh, church, grace, yes. That's not what they think of, but we want to change that thinking. We want to be a place where we go, oh, so gracious, so kind, so forgiving, so much of what God gave them, they are giving out to others. Amen? And so we moved on from grace, and then we talked about what if we led with honor? In a generation now where honor is a lost art, we said, what if we led with honor and brought that back? And then last week, we preached everybody's favorite message, okay, about what if we were generous? And we talked about tithing, and everyone's like, yay, more talk about money, Dan, right? Yeah, everybody loves that topic. They're like, ooh, I invited all my friends. Why did I do that, right? But we have to talk about being generous, and we have to talk about money because here's the deal. Jesus is generous. God was generous to us, is not So we don't want to be a stingy, cheap church. We don't want to make God look like he's cheap because he's not. His grace is amazing, and it's lavish, and it's abundant, and it's amazing. Amen? Okay, now I've almost got you there. I'm doing all this work just to get you ready. I'm almost out of breath. Today, we're going to move into what if... What if we committed to community? What if we committed to community? We are going to absolutely, at Cornerstone, commit to live in community with each other, okay? And I want to kind of give you some ideas around this and and some handles to pick this up and walk along with this. And so either you can watch and follow along with the notes on the screen. If you want to, you can go to our website, cornerstonechurchatx.com. You can hit download the app. On the app, these notes are there. You can take digital notes if you'd like. Either way, we're going to roll into this. So first, what if, who are you committed to? The question is this, who are you committed to? See, each one of us are committed to certain things. Some of us are on the PTO. Some of us are on the school board. Some of us are the head of LTYA, which is, we need to pray for them because that's rough, right? <laughs> yes, All right. Those are, those are tough times, but we're committed to a lot of things. Some of us are married, so we're committed to our spouse. Some of us have kids, and some of us are kind of committed to our kids, Right? Some of us are so committed to our kids that we're trying to live out our dreams through our kids because we didn't actually make it to a professional team. So we're trying to do it through them. Tongue in cheek, Lake Travis joke, no? (laughs) Teasing, there's nothing wrong with it. Make your kids play sports. That's a good thing. They learn team. They learn great community on a team, amen? I learned a lot about how to lose even though I hate it, okay? I'm not teach your kid to be a loser. Teach them to be (laughs) grin and bear it and do better next time, right? Uh, But on teams, that's a good thing. A lot of us are committed to a lot of different things. What are you committed to and who are you committed to? This is a priority shakeup is what this is. 
This, I'm going to take your priority, priority box, and I'm going to go and shake it up and go, who and why? And maybe there's a few things that might have to tumble out and go, mm, I'm committed to some things I might need to decommit. You know, like any one of our high schoolers, they commit to one school, then another school calls and offers more money, and they decommit, and then they recommit. You guys ever seen this? Decommit, recommit, decommit. recommit. Yeah, we're not going to do that. We're going to commit to the right things and stay focused. But there, in order to do that, you might have to decommit to some things that you've committed to that you shouldn't be committed to. Ooh, that's a lot of commitment, huh? And so we're going to talk through that. Who are you committed to? What groups of people get the best of what you have to offer? I want you to think about that for a minute. What groups of people get the best of what you have to offer? And this should run a little bit of a cool glass of water down our spine. Because sometimes our jobs get the best of us, don't they? Not they get the best of us, they get the best of us. In other words, we go and we'll pull out all of our energy, we'll put out all of our strength, we'll put all of our niceness and kindness at work, and we come home and we're nasty. Am I the, no? This never happens in your homes? You guys always come home and you guys are like, oh, blessings, how are you? Oh, husband, so beautiful, I bow with thy feet in glorious adornment. Oh, wife, glorious to see you cherub children. Thank you for strewing all of your clothes around our house in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> then stop looking at me like that. Sometimes we go to work, and, okay, I'll put it in my basket. Sometimes I go to work and I work for a church. You guys know it? It's called Cornerstone. You ever seen it? Great place, good looking people, right? And I give the best of all I've got all day to the church, and then I go home and I'm not very nice to my family. Am I the only person here? Okay, remember, at Cornerstone, you don't have to be perfect, but you must be. Tell the truth. We don't have it all together. Now, don't be down about it. Get up and whip it. And let's go. All right? But sometimes we have to ask ourselves, what groups of people get the best of what you have to offer? Because my wife should get the very best I have to offer. When I come home, I should be the nicest, the kindest, the sweetest, the most serving, the most encouraging and loving to that sweet girl in the little influencer hat over there. Okay? <laughs> She's updating her Instagram currently. <laughs> and then, after that, my children. Right? And the only way that that happens is if I'm committed to God first and I start my day right. If not, I'm starting behind. I'm starting on the wrong foot. I'm committed to the wrong thing. And then after that, then there come some priorities that we have to put in line. Work is kind of a good thing, right? Those are all good things in there. But we leave one out all the time. And you know what it's called? Church. Church. We leave out the church. Okay? And here, here's just some questions. Is the church in that group? Is the church in your priority list? Let me explain to you the church. You know what the church is? Yes. It's not a building. Cornerstones prove that. We've gone everywhere. <laughs> we got like PTSD from moving so much. But I'll tell you what we've done. We've remained the church. Because the church is not a building. It's the ecclesia, the called out ones. Okay? The called out ones. Who stand in there? You know what else the church is? In the scripture, it's called the bride of Christ. Guess what we don't believe in? Domestic violence. Never okay. Be careful how you talk about any church because that is Jesus' bride. Now, I understand they may have hurt you. You may have been upset. One, you may have been wrong. <gasps> no, not you. Somebody else in the story. Right? One, be careful how you speak about that church because that is the bride of Christ. And we don't believe in domestic violence. We don't believe in domestic violence, do we? No. I'm glad we cleared that up early in the message. This is the bride of Christ. This is the body of Christ. This is the family of God. 
And so we don't beat that up. But the question is, are you committed to it? Why or why not? What's holding you back? What is stopping you? Because when you do get committed to the church and that you get committed to the people in the church, in the community that God's called you to, incredible things can happen. I didn't say everything's easy. I said incredible things can happen. Here's what it says in Acts 2.42 is one of the greatest examples for you of what can happen in community. It says this in Acts 2. It says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayers. Sound good? Sound like church? This is the early church. In fact, Acts chapter 2 is the birth of the church. Okay? The breaking of bread and prayers and awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Sounds like a good church. Does that sound like a good church to you? Mm, you don't want to be a part of this church. You don't want to be a part of that church. Look at it. Day by day attending the temple? Every day? You want to go to church every day? Oh, <laughs> good answer. Day by day breaking bread in their homes. When was the last time you had somebody in your home? Well, Dan, it's COVID. Can't have everybody in your home. Really? You've been to the grocery store? Only a couple hundred people there, huh? We made it there. You've been to a football game? Yeah. You've been out? Yeah. This is not an anti, this is not a mask, anti-mask. This is not a COVID. This is not a political thing. My question is this. When was the last time you had somebody in your home and broke bread with them? This is a dying art. This is what the church was committed to early on, right? They received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And who added to their number? Who? The Lord. It's not my job to build the church. People get that very twisted and misunderstood. Well, Dan, you better grow that thing and make sure we go to two services. Otherwise, you're not doing your job, and I'm going to judge you from my seat because welcome to the church. Am I wrong, or have you ever heard that before? Yeah. Yeah. God adds to the church. My job is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. My job is to tell you the truth in love. My job is to organize and to plan and prepare and build a great opportunity for you. But let's go back. Go back to the slide just before because there's some other things that they did here. Right? All who believe were together and had all things in common. Here's the part you really don't want to do. Right? And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. How many of you guys want to sell everything you got? I knew this would be a popular message. But we put up a GoFundMe for Carolyn and Chad because guess what? They didn't see a brain tumor coming. You know what we did this week? We had to move the goal because we already crushed it. We did. We already moved the goal. And how many of you know that sometimes unexpected expenses come up that are not medical. It's still up. If you haven't participated, go back to last week's message. Be generous. I put my name on that line. I didn't say private. I made it public because I wanted to make sure everybody understood where Cornerstone stands behind its people. So we're not going to talk about it on a Sunday and not live it on a Monday. We're going to step up and we're going to do it. Okay? But this is what they did. They gave what they had because others had needs. How many of you guys have ever been frustrated with the lack of community in your community? Okay. Then we have a job to do, don't we? Because we're not going to talk about it. We're going to be about it. I'm going to put a graphic up here from Barna in his research, and it's, this is my question to you. It says, what if community was critical? How much of what you do is influenced by those closest to you? What if it was critical? 
we'll go ahead and put this slide up here. This is from Barner Research Company that's going to talk to you about the different generations and how they feel. Americans are friendly but lonely, right? How many of you guys have hundreds and hundreds of friends on social media but yet sometimes feel lonely? Don't raise your hand because this is what this stat's going to tell you. One in five adults regularly or often feel lonely. On average, people have five close friends. You guys ever heard the statistic that you are the average of your five closest friends? Who you're around matters. Who you allow to influence you matters. Who you listen to matters. Who are the lonely? Men, 22%. Gosh, we're a sad bunch, right? Women, only 15%. Millennials, they take the lead here, okay? According to, according to Barna Research, Millennials, 25%. Gen X, how many Gen Xers are here? Nice. It's us. It's like four of us. That's awesome. Gen X, we're 24%. Boomers, how many boomers are here? Okay, boomer. <laughs> I've been waiting to say that. That's a joke for the millennials. Um, <laughs> And then elders at 6%, okay, single or married. These are statistics of how people are lonely in our communities because we are not committed to community. We have to be committed to community. And Cornerstone is going to drive that sled, okay, because people matter. What name can I write on this screen that it's okay if they feel lonely? What name? No name. We have a job to do. We have something to accomplish because community matters. Community absolutely matters. In Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12, it says, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will f uh, lift up his fellow, but woe to him who is alone. When he falls, and has no other one to lift him up again. If two lie together to keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? Gentlemen, you should get married. <laughs> you guys are so angry this morning. <laughs> Why are you so angry? Good grief. I go to bed with my wife and she's warm. It's fun. Oh, like this is news to you. <laughs> like you guys didn't know. All right, whatever. <laughs> keep preaching. Whatever. Again, if two lie together and keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who was alone, two would withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. It's telling you right now community is absolutely critical, critical and your connection, right? Your connection determines your content. Right now, some of you are going, I don't think that's true. Your connection determines your content. You'd be like, no, the source determines the content. Okay, if you're right. I got the privilege of going out to a friend of mine's ranch who is very gracious and very generous to us and said, hey, you can come out here and spend some time. We were out there just doing all the things that this bougie redneck likes to do, right? Like driving a tractor, shooting guns, right? Uh, mowing, cutting things down, driving music. Are you guys, anybody here enjoy ranches? Okay, got it. Sorry, I'm just trying to get you somewhere in the conversation here today, okay? And I'm out there and I'm having a lot of fun. But here's what happened. How many of you guys know that kids are not always about doing work on a ranch? They sometimes like to look at devices and or screens. Does anybody know that? Okay. You know what amazing thing happened for us? The internet ran out. You want to know why? Because we were there the weekend before and we used it all up. <laughs> okay, I'm going to tell you the whole truth, right? All right? Because he's made a smart choice of limiting how much internet should be available out there. Now, staying connected is good and important, but when the internet ran out, okay, and they opened up Netflix and wanted to watch something at night, guess what happened? Mm, right? Is Netflix short on content? Is Netflix short on content? My connection was unable to access it. Now, how much more important is God than Netflix? Your connection matters. Who you're connected to. So the question becomes, who are you connected to and what kind of access do they have to the living God? Do they know who he is? 
Are they able to access him? Are they able to talk with him? You see, that's the importance of my spiritual father. I met with him this week and learned things from him that I did not know. Why? Because he hears from God. And sometimes this big 300-pound gorilla standing in front of you doesn't always hear clearly. Sometimes I'm stubborn. But it's really good for me to be connected to people who can hear. Because sometimes they have to say things like this to you. You know you don't have to do everything, right? And I'm like, what? I don't have to do everything? He goes, you realize if you're doing everything, it creates no room for someone to step up and do that, right? I'm like, huh. Yeah, so. I'm a fairly smart individual. Well, before I had kids, I had a lot of brains. Now I have a little bit less. And then he goes, but you know what the problem will, will be for you, Dan? If you can do it better, you'll just do it and not let somebody else do it. And I'm like, oh, shoot. Someone woke up on the salty side of the bed. I was like, hmm, because he's right. I've had my team look at me at times and say, sometimes you don't let us fail, Dan. I'm like, why would I let you fail? Because you learn better when you fail. You've got to have people around you who are connected to the right source. And your connection to them matters because they may have something that you need. It's the family of God. The scripture says this, some are a head, some are a toe, some are a body. And it gives this illustration of a, a human body. And what does the toe have the right to say to the head? You're not supposed to be I'm more important than you. No, no, no. Connection matters. Because you know what? If my feet don't work, my head can tell me to go somewhere to get some food, but my feet won't take me there. That's a problem. That's disconnection. That's disunity. So the body starves because ha my feet are having a rebellion. Or my hands need to go do work. So that that way I can make some money to be able to provide for my family. But my hands say, mm, we're not willing to do the work today. They don't get under the authority of the head. And they decide, we don't want to because we're tired. We worked last week. So we're not doing it anymore. So therefore, there's no money. So therefore, kids don't eat. I'm telling you all things about the body. But how many of you know we are the body of Christ? You ever been with a group of people who don't really want to get connected in a church? Because they don't want to serve? Because they'll abuse their time. Because A, B, C, D, F, G. And we wonder why people are not banging down the doors of churches. Because men of God have not stood in a pulpit and told you the truth in love saying, hey, we're in this together. If one of us suffers, we all suffer. If one of us gets a report from a doctor that says you have a brain tumor, that means all of us are praying as if we have one. You want to change your prayer world? Pray as if you're the one who has that brain tumor this week. How hard would you pray this week? How would you reorganize your time this week? One, reorganize it and say thank you to God that it isn't you. Say, God, thank you. Because it changes the way you think. How do I know this week? I said to my wife, I said, I'm just discontent today. She's like, why are you discontent? She goes, you're married to me. Everything's amazing. <laughs> she didn't say that, but she's right. And I was just discontent. Then I remembered a practice that my spiritual father taught me. Just go through and list everything you're thankful for. So I went in my office and I just sat there and said, God, thank you for my toes. Thank you for my feet that work. Thank you for my legs. Thank you for my knees. Thank you for my legs that are strong. Sometimes too strong. <laughs> thank, you for, thank you for my back. Thank you for my arms. I went through pretty much everything I could think of. My tongue, my ears, my eyes, my jaw. Why? Because it was a spiritual discipline to go back and remember and be thankful for what I have. You know what was incredible right after that? I wasn't discontent anymore. I found myself just happier. Why? Because I took the time to go through the process. Why am I telling you that? Because if I wasn't connected to the right people, I wouldn't have had the right content in order to do what God's calling me to do when I was having a problem. And when you run into a problem, you better be connected to the church. 
When you run into life, you better be connected to the church. And it can't just be the church that you think you want to go to because it has a really nice program. It has to be the church that God said, this is where I want you because that's where I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to pour out my blessing there. That's what I have for you there. That's Psalm 1, trees that are planted by living water, to which God says, I will provide and dig every resource that you need, and it has to get to you. And so you've got to be connected to the right source. At the end of the day, what are you connected to and what are you committed to being connected to? Because the truth of the matter is we're committed to a lot of things, but I don't know that they're helping us. I don't know that they're pushing us to be what God's called us to be. So who you're connected to matters. Your connection will determine your content, and then who you're connected to and who you're committed to are two critical questions that you have to ask yourself. You've got to ask, because those you're committed to will either fuel you or fail you. They will fuel you or they will fail you. And it's critical that you know who God's called you to be connected to and that you stay committed to it. Let me explain to you what I see today. I see this all the time. Want to get together? Sure, let's get together. What works for you? This date, that date, boom, bang, text back and forth. Pick the date. Here it is. Now we're there. Guess what happens the hour or the day before? Somebody cancels. Why? Because something came up. What happened to commitment? What happened to because I said I would? What happened to it's my word, and my word is important to me, and therefore I prioritized, and therefore I said no to everybody having access to me that has access to me. So that, that way I can prioritize those who God's called me to be with. Is this totally missing? Or is this just hitting and you're quiet about it? We have to make priority decisions. And that means everybody can't have access to me for their benefit. That means I have to be divinely connected to who God's called me to be and committed to those who he's called me to be with. Otherwise, I don't have enough in the tank to give what I'm called to give. We can't say yes to everything we have to start saying no to things that are really, really good, but they're not best. It's a priority conversation. And what if we were committed to connecting with the people God's called us to be with? How do you know that in this room right now that there's not someone who walked in here who desperately needs encouragement, love, hope, a job, counseling, healing, hope, whatever these things could be? And maybe God wants you to bring it to him today. It wasn't about you getting in your car and driving to church. It was about God saying, I want to restore all things today. And because I want to do that, I'm going to send you to church. But the question is, is your connection so good and your Wi-Fi streaming so fast that you can hear his voice and when he says it, you know exactly what to do? John 14, 15, and 16, Jesus says, the only thing I did is what Jesus saw the Father doing. Here's a hard question. What are you seeing God doing in the spirit realm that's not happening in the physical realm that he's excited for you to participate in? Because maybe he wants you to bring it. Could you imagine? What would church look like if instead of driving to church and deciding whether we're going to go or not based on how long they preach or whether the air conditioning is good, instead we showed up and said, maybe God wants to use me to help someone today to show them you're worth it. You're valuable. God's got a call and a demand on your life to do something that nobody else has ever done. The pastor's not the only one who can do that. By a show of hands, and I'm asking you to raise your hand if this is true, have I ever said something to you that was divinely orchestrated, that encouraged, inspired, connected, healed, gave hope, encouragement, or love that you desperately needed in that moment. Let me see your hands. Now, <laughs> my wife's hands are not up. That's just depressing. <laughs> <laughs> she keeps me humble. <laughs> Do me a favor one more time. Would you put your hands up? 
Look around the room. <laughs> she put her hand up this time. Keep your hand up. Keep your hand up. Keep your hand up. Keep your hand up. Look around the room. Look them in the eyeballs. Look them in the face. First, recognize these are good-looking people. Yeah. Now put your hands down. Here comes my right hand. Brace. Brace, everybody. What if God wanted to use you instead of me? Because I can tell you this is not the Dan show. This is about God. And he is so much bigger and so much greater and so much smarter and so much wiser and so much more compassionate and kind and loving. And he has things to bring these gifts to each person. And the way he chooses to do it is through you. Jesus said, I have to go in order to send the comforter. And the comforter now lives in you, the Holy Spirit. We teach kids wrong all the time. We tell them that Jesus lives in there. In their what? We teach them wrong. Jesus went back to be with the Father. Who did he leave with us? The Holy Spirit lives in your heart. Where if we tune in to that frequency and we listen, because God wants to say something to you to help her. Because God cares about everybody, not just me. What if we came to church like that today? What if we came in saying, God, what do you want to do today? And how can I participate in what you want to accomplish? I can tell you this. I'm not a very smart man. I married really smart. That's smart. I've got a few things in my belt. One, I depend on him every day. And it's critical that I do. And when I do, everything flows from there. He tells me about an authority. He tells me about honor. He tells me about commitment. He tells me about love. He tells me about grace. He tells me about mercy. He tells me about justice. He tells me to be concerned about the things he's concerned about. You notice this in scripture? You never saw Jesus running anywhere, did you? Because he wasn't in a hurry about anything. Because he was only focused on what God told him to do, not everything else. And I don't know about you, but I find myself rushing sometimes. And I'm trying to get to the next appointment, and I'm late to this one, and I'm trying to get to the next because I'm settling for good instead of best. Because I've lost my connection here, which is the most critical thing for me. Because he can provide for me any way he wants. But we've got to be committed to that connection. And if we lose that connection, and we lose that commitment with each other, we are paralyzing the church. The church should be the most loving. The church should be the most kind. The church should be the most generous. Is it today? Is it? The capital C church, is it? It's not. You want to know why? We've lost our connection. And we've got to get our connection back. I'm going to read something to you. It's going to be way out of left field. I'm going to do a little work here, and I know what time it is, I promise you. I'm going to have him put the 23rd Psalm up here. You guys familiar with the 23rd Psalm? Where do they read this the most? What kind of activity? Funerals. Let's read it. I'll read it to you. You don't have to read it out loud. It says, Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down. Hmm. You ever think about that word? He makes me lie down. Call rest. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Next slide. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me and your rod and your staff, they come from me. Stay right there for a minute. Everybody reads this at funerals because it talks about death. Because the word death is in there. I noticed something this week because my spiritual father showed me some things about this and said, you know how everybody reads this for funerals? There's so much more in there. 
And I was like, you're right. And I spent some time in here. And guess what I noticed? He wa- even though I walked through the valley of the shadow of death, is it death or is it the shadow? Is the shadow real? It looks like me. It moves like me. If the sun is here, my shadow is here, and I move my arm, it looks like me, it does like me, but it's not me. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff will comfort me. We get confused and think things that are not real are real. Our social media influence, the amount of money we make, the kind of car we drive, the kind of house we live in, the kind of college we can or cannot provide for our kids. What do our clothes look like? What is the job I have? And we settle for the fake. It's the shadow. And everything that God has for us, the devil has a counterfeit. It looks like it's blessing. It looks like it's great, but it's not. It's a shadow. And in this scripture, I learned that even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I don't have to fear any evil. Keep going. This is going to be incredible when it finishes out. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, and you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness. Hold on. Let's stop there. God will put you right in front of your enemies. You know what your enemies want to do? Your enemies want to stop you. They want to kill you. They want to cease you. They want to end you, right? That's what enemies do, right? And God says, I'm going to put you right in front. I'm going to prepare a table, and you can sit right there. You know what happens? When you're sitting at a table, are you vulnerable? Yeah. Are you fighting? Then who has to fight for you? What if we sat at the table and let God provide for us? What if we sat at the communion table and understood that the blood that covered my sin provides for everything forevermore? And I don't have to worry, and I don't have to stress, and I don't have to consume myself with what people think of me. Instead, I can sit at the table that the Lord provided for me, and even though enemies stand around me, and they want to destroy me, they want to pull me down, they want to end and annihilate my being and my creativity and my calling and my purpose, God will fight the battle for me. What I have to do is I have to sit at the table. And until I get committed to sitting at the table, I've missed my purpose because I'm in God's way now. Because all of a sudden, I'm out there fighting a job that God's saying, I can fight that. Oh, you got it, Dan? Go ahead. Let me know how that works. And I come back all beat up and bruised. I come back all hurt. And God's saying, you could have just sat here and had dinner. Because I prepared this table. I knew your enemies were there. I invited them to the table. Think about that. God might invite your enemies right to your table because he wants to provide and protect and show off. And we wonder why these people are allowed to touch our lives or say these things and do these things because God brought them there. The problem is you got out of position. You got up from the seat of authority. You understand in biblical times when you were sitting, that was a place of authority. We kind of have it a little bit backwards in our culture. In the tabernacle, the priest would sit and teach the word of God because it was the authority. And the people would stand. You ever seen churches where they make you stand for the reading of the word? That's why. That's why. Today's culture, we put you inside a seat so you can be comfy and I stand and try to work and get you around the word. See how it's backwards? When you sit at the table and you sit there and and he prepares a table before me in the presence of your enemies, and he anoints my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Then it says the best stuff. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We can hardly dwell in the house of God for an hour. How long is this service going to be, Dan? It's 11, 18. You're supposed to be done three minutes ago. I know. I did it all on purpose. I'm dirty like that. You want to know why? Because every person who's here made a decision about being with God forever. That's why you're in church. Every person in here made a decision about being in the house of the Lord forever. That's why you're here in church. And we have to start calling spades spades. 
We're good with eternity with God, but just not an hour or two of serving his house. We're okay with eternity, but we're not okay with community. Because community might cost me. How do I know? My phone rings at the most inopportune times. You want to know when kids run away from mom and dad? Friday night. When I'm trying to go on a date night with my wife. You want to know when someone loses their mind and says, I need help because I'm going to divorce them? Saturday morning when I'm supposed to spend time with my kids. You want to know when someone calls you and says, by the way, I have a brain tumor. It's not between the hours of nine and five. It's within the hours of I'm available. And if you hurt, I hurt. And if you need something, I'm right here. And if you walk away, I'm going to stand right here and you can walk back and you'll find me still standing right here doing what I said I would do because I'm called by God to be more. And Cornerstone has been called by God to live and be committed to community because too many people lack the commitment to do what God's called them to do today. You want to know why we don't see more miracles? You want to know why we don't see more happening? We can't be found in his house. In his presence, there's fullness of joy. Where two or three are gathered, there I'm in the midst. Why is anxiety crippling America? We've forgotten how to get in God's presence because we're busy. We're not committed anymore. We've got to be committed. I get it. You're like, Dan, we're all here. Yeah, I know. The average person in Austin, Texas, you know how many times they go to church a week? I'm sorry, not a week, a month. 1.3 times. 1.3 1.3 times. We've got a commitment problem. I love you. I appreciate you. But I told you I will stand behind this pulpit and I will stand behind this word and I will tell you the truth regardless of how it makes you feel. Because far too long men have stood behind these pulpits and told you what you wanted to hear. And it didn't help you. It hurt you. And you're frustrated with it now. And you can't get back the time you wasted. But God can restore what the canker worm stole, what the moth ate. God can restore and heal and bring back double portion to you. The question is, are you committed or is it inconvenient? You've got to make that call. Would you bow your heads with me? This is a hard word. And I came here and wanted to be kind. But I want to be obedient more than I want to be kind. What is God calling you to? What are you committed to? Are you committed to his house? I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Every one of our goals is to get to heaven. What if heaven wanted to get to earth? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And God's been waiting for us to bring heaven to earth. So right now, I just want to ask you to take stock for a minute. Just think. What's God saying? Why did he bring you here to hear this? Maybe it's about committing. Cornerstone's going to be a place that commits. What will you commit? How will you commit? Before we move on, with your heads bowed just for a minute, if you're here, one of the most critical commitments you'll ever make is to give your heart to Jesus Christ because of his death, his burial, and and his resurrection, which gives you opportunity to connect to his family. That's the eternal life we're talking about. That's heaven. 
in his presence. If you're here and you say, Dad, I have never made that decision. It's as simple as a quiet decision between you and the Lord right where you are. Just to say, Lord, I choose you. Would you forgive me of my sins? Put me back together. I choose you. If you're here, it's important that we take the moment and recognize it. So with everybody's heads bowed and eyes closed, nobody looking around, if you've never made that decision, but you feel like God's asking you to make that call today, one, God sees you. Two, I want to see you and I want to pray for you. So would you just look up and catch eyes with me and let me know that you're here? Thank you. I've been waiting for that. Hold on. You can keep looking at me. I'm going to tell you right now. I love you, bro. I've been praying for you. I hinted at it in my pre-service when I told my people, what if God wanted to send somebody here today wearing what you're wearing? That's how big God is. That's how far he'll go to chase you down and find you because he loves you. I know the rest of you are being kind. Your heads are bowed. I'm going to ask you for patience for one more minute. I want to explain to you what just happened in your room, in your church. I talked to the people who are here at 9 o'clock setting up in a pregame. I said, what if God wanted to use you? And I gave the example of the men who dug a hole in the roof of a house to get their paralyzed friend to Jesus. And I said, what are you willing to do to get people closer to Jesus today? I challenged everybody in the room. And I said a very specific statement about what if someone came in and God could give you a vision for them and tell you what they were wearing and telling you exactly what it is they need so that that way you can do it because he wants to use you today. That exact example, which I will not tell you the details of, to not embarrass anybody. That person walked in wearing exactly what that color is. That person just looked up to me and said, I need to walk across the threshold of eternity separated from God to an eternity connected to God. And the scripture says the angels rejoice when one person comes back to the Father. Amen? I know we went long. I know I preached hard. Is it worth it if one person gets reconnected back to their Heavenly Father? Thank you for being that church. Thank you for giving me your grace. And thank you for providing a room where one lost sheep can finally find its way home. Because nobody can take that away now. That's eternal. I'm going to pray for you and go, Lord, thank you so much. God, for every person that's here, God, I pray your blessing over them, that, God, you would keep them. God, I pray that the words that we've spoken here, God, would find good soil, that, Lord, you would bless them, that you would keep them, that, God, you would make your face shine upon them. God, I pray that you would give them your peace. In Jesus' name, everybody said? So everybody, this is actually where we're going to do a really quick gathering of the offering uh, where we take your tithes. If you're new here, don't worry about that. Remember I mentioned the Connect card? Please drop that Connect card in one of the baskets coming around. As far as giving, this is because of you that we're able to do the outreach into our communities here locally in Austin and across the world as well. So this is really important. There's several different ways you can do it. The good old-fashioned way with the baskets going around. You can also text to give. The number's up here. Visit the website if that's better for you. And then, of course, the old-fashioned snail mail. We'll take that, too. So a quick reminder of the events that are coming up, you guys, next week. Two services, 9.30 and 11 o'clock. 
So if you can serve one and attend one, that's fantastic. November 5th is the women, the women's meeting here at 9.30 in the morning where Dan is going to speak to us about the future of women and this church. Um, feel free to take some a little bit of time off of your day to come in for that. November 8th is the baptism that I mentioned. Sign up for that. We would love to see you uh, at that. November 15th, the baby devotion. Do we hear an awe? Ah, uh, okay. And November 22nd is a special day. That's our Friendsgiving. So with that, you guys, God bless you all. Thank you for being here.